Thank you for coming to our final day of our conference. Just a quick reminder that all of our sessions will be available on our website starting next week. So if you would like access to slides or resources that our presenters will be mentioning, you can ask for those in the chat or you can check back on our website next week. And just another reminder that we will be conducting polls on how your experience was using our conference platform. So please be sure to fill out a evaluation for a chance to win in our raffle. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Katharina. Sarah, did you put the slides up? Oh, yeah, I just have Sarah, my slides. Sarah, do you have the slides up? I, I don't have your slides up. I don't have, huh? I don't see Hold on, let me try this. Okay, um, hello, my name is Katharina Strang, and I'm very excited to introduce you to the session that we are having today, and it's called Let's Talk Vapes, Marijuana, and Youth. And we have a very experienced panel to present on this presentation, and from past um, surveys that we've done with school-based health administrators, we did find that this was a topic that was of great interest, especially in today's day and age. Let me go ahead and introduce you to the speakers. Um, I am from the California Department of Public Health, the Nutrition Education Obesity Prevention Branch, and Sarah Planchi is from the Department of Education. She oversees the Tobacco Use Prevention Office. And then we have um, Julie from the California Department of Public Health as well, and she's in the Tobacco Control Branch. And then so she is from the Santa Clara County, just from the local view. But what I wanted to share with you before we get started is why CDPH, or the California Department of Public Health, got involved with school-based health centers. About four years ago, we received funding to work with all of the programs across CDPH to see how we could better support school-based health centers. This slide, you kind of see a mixture of the folks and discipline that have formed a work group for CDPH to reach out to school-based health centers and provide resources and technical assistance. The mission of the school-based health centers initiative is to really to bridge the gap that we found between government, public health, healthcare programs, and school-based health centers to improve the dissemination of information and resources that we all have available, and even data collection to better serve these students in California communities. The work group is composed of a cross-department work group, in which is a great opportunity to really find out what resources and skill sets are available that even us at CDPH didn't know about. So you have everyone from tobacco to opioids to nutrition to STIs to a variety of other areas, and we've been working hard to put together data collection that can be used in the field as well. And finally, before we move on, I did want to bring to your attention, there's a resource guide that you can download if you go to the sponsors section of the website for the conference. And that resource guide has links to every resource from all the disciplines that participate in the work group. Either you can download them or you can actually um, go to their websites and ask for individuals for support with technical assistance, et cetera. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sarah, who is our first presenter 
who will talk about CDE's program on Tupi. Hi, and thanks everyone. Just trying to pull up my um, PowerPoint. And I'm looking to open up my PowerPoint, share my screen. Katharina, can you please stop screen sharing so that Sarah can start screen sharing? Thank you. I'm having some difficulty pulling it up. Sorry, folks, but I'll be right with you. Let's see. Hopefully you're able to see that. Terrific, yep, thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so let me start off by saying good afternoon to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for selecting uh, to attend this breakout session. Um, so please, and I want to say thank you to the California School-Based Health Alliance for inviting us to present today. Um, I think it's also important to say this is a great collaboration. Truly uh, very pleased to be collaborating with uh, Julie Lausch from the California Department of Public Health and Sonia Gutierrez from the Santa Clara County Office of Education. So uh, this is just a very brief agenda because I know we have a lot to cover. I'm trying to set the stage really to provide you with some background on vaping, uh, the incidence of vaping and marijuana and what that's all about. Uh, popularity among young people, uh, provide you with some data, including some trends in vaping, cigarette and marijuana use and introduce the concept of the triangulum, stay tuned. Um, I'd also like to speak with you about our health concerns for youth, uh, given these products and um, the epidemic proportions in which they're being used. And then finally, um, TUPI's response. So TUPI, again, is our acronym for the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Office, but we're better known as TUPI. So let's talk vaping devices. Um, I think it's important to kind of have a, a vaping device 101. So vaping devices, we get this question is pretty regularly and it's a good question. Um, you know, what is the difference between vaping and electronic cigarettes and e-cigs and all these terms, you know, is it the same thing? And the quick answer is yes, these terms can be really used interchangeably. Um, I have a definition of what vaping is, and it's kind of our umbrella term, but vaping is essentially an electronic device that heats up liquids, and it usually contains nicotine and flavorings and other substances. And then when heated, it creates an aerosol, and then the user inhales it. So that's the kind of vaping 101. That's, you know, vaping e-cigarettes, all can be used pretty much interchangeably. So some background on vaping, and sometimes the picture does in detail a thousand words. These are up close and personal, some pictures of various vaping devices. Um, Juul, Soren, Soren Air, hookah pens, um, puff bars or bars sometimes as they're known. That's another very popular vaping device. You also see on the slide that to the right of the image, we have some information about whether it's a closed system or an open system. More on that later. 
And the next slide, it's just a continuation so that you have uh, some imagery of what we're talking about when we're referring to vaping devices. Um, very popular on, on the upper right are the mods and tanks, these open systems. And I also want to point out at the bottom right, the novelty of some of these e-cigarette e devices. If you look up close, um, you're going to think that we got it wrong and there was some sort of a mistake. No, no mistake. That is an item in an e-cigarette device that looks like a lipstick. So um, these items and devices are meant to be alluring to certain populations. And we hear, and as we know, these populations are, are youth. So um, we talked very, very briefly, as, again, just trying to set the stage for our other presenters too. We talked about, uh, about uh, vaping devices. And um, it's important to note that these vaping devices are now being used to vape marijuana. So in the first bullet, just like nicotine vaping devices, marijuana vape work by heating uh, liquid or an oil that become a vapor that the user inhales. And um, the second bullet point really is to demonstrate that it's hard to tell whether it's a nicotine uh, delivery device or a, a marijuana delivery device. They look very similar. Um, so my comment earlier about um, open or closed system. So what happens is some of these devices are created in a way that you can open them up and you can add different flavors, e-juices, e-liquids, marijuana. So um, this is very disconcerting because um, there isn't control on how these devices are being used. Um, also, if you ever go on to YouTube and want to check out how to do that, there are demonstrations of how to crack into these devices so you can manipulate it. So. Um, we're always concerned that youth who should be active in school and doing very positive, productive things are spending time potentially in these sort of endeavors. The triangulum. So I just want to point out that this is a term that we use in tobacco control in California. And um, this is the best kind of definition of the intersection of tobacco, marijuana, and e-cigarettes. And of course, the latter being the delivery device for all of these and other substances. A uh, comment about marijuana and tobacco related disparities. So, you know, marijuana does indeed threaten to exacerbate tobacco related disparities. And this comes from our background and our knowledge in tobacco control and working in that environment. So we found that there are neighborhoods who um, have indeed struggled trying to limit the number of tobacco retailers in their community. And now they're finding it's the same thing with marijuana retailers. And often these communities are lower income neighborhoods. Um, and we worry about that. It hurts the community and uh, youth who see this or have to pass by it every day. Um, you know, it's it's just present and um, reachable and always there. And um, this is a lesson learned from tobacco control in the same way that um, they've struggled with um, densely populated tobacco retailers. Now we're seeing the same practices with marijuana. The popularity of vaping. So how did this happen? They seem to appear suddenly. Um, this was maybe six, seven years ago. And the problem is they appeared everywhere. So, you know, corner stores, gas stations, vape shops, and then online. Um, and when you see something that's everywhere and ubiquitous, it's sometimes the, the message can be, well, they're everywhere, uh, maybe they're, that's normal or it's harmless. And we're always concerned about that. And, you know, we think that youth 
um, the more youth that see them, the more likely they're going to uh, buy and use them. And then just a last comment about, you know, how do students get them? So as previously mentioned, but also just online, a comment about that, it's often just clicking off a box that you are of an age, um, 21 or older, and that you can purchase that. So with a credit card and the clicking of the box, an underage youth could easily acquire a new cigarette online. Uh, popularity about uh, among uh, young people continued. So just want to point out the marketing campaigns that have been pushed out there. I know Julie's going to speak um, more about that. Um, billboards, um, you may have, um, you very likely have seen some of the ads and billboards with uh, very popular celebrities endorsing some of these products. So it helps to normalize this product and, you know, that person's attractive and seem healthy, you know, it, it can give a very mixed message to our youth. Um, as previously mentioned, the YouTube videos um, and then social media just continues to fuel popularity. Um, tons of campaigns that um, our youth can see and it influences them. So um, I just wanted to take a moment here and, and kind of preface this slide by saying uh, prior to 2011, we found that marijuana use in California um, amongst youth was actually on the decline. So we were really pleased with this trend. And then all of a sudden our data sets, you know, from California Healthy Kids Survey, that's what the California Department of Education uses, especially within our program office. We were seeing input and feedback from youth that there seemed to be more kind of positive attitudes associated with marijuana. Uh, or another way to put it is that there seemed to be um, the perception that marijuana was not as risky, it was not as bad for you. Um, then there were some other studies that seemed to mirror that from monitoring the future survey with the number of young people who believe marijuana use is risky is just simply decreasing. Um, and then, you know, with data sets, of course, numbers are, are important to look at, but then we're always asking the why. Um, so we kind of are hypothesizing that maybe the legalization of marijuana for medical use or adult rec use in other states, now of course, which is the case in California, but even back then, that may have affected the views that you've had about marijuana, that maybe it wasn't as harmful as they were taught to believe. And then finally, um, just going back to one of my earlier slides about the technology, you know, that hot pink and kind of techy look, um, we believe it gives youth an array of new forms and devices for um, marijuana and nicotine dependence. They're just attractive devices to youth. So to help round out what I've been talking about here, if you look at um, combustible cigarettes or current smoking or whole cigarette, and then jump down to current e-cigarettes, you'll see that, um, you know, the use of e-cigarettes uh, doubled, sometimes tripled, right? Um, within certain, um, you know, batched terms of the years, like 2013, 15. Um, so, you know, we saw this trend where youth were consuming e-cigarettes. And then we saw that, you know, the current marijuana are pretty high rates. You know, if you go to uh, grade 11 and look down at the bottom, 2013, 15, 20% uh, of 11th graders are using marijuana. Um, really, really high numbers and um, certainly got our attention. Just another slide um, with just a longer date range from 2011 to 19. It looks like some of the levels of, um, of marijuana use may, um, they've kind of held their own, maybe slightly decreasing, but of course we're always going to seek to understand the why behind that. 
you know, what's happening. Um, the good news is that in California, uh, we seem to be doing better than um, generally that, that the rest of the nation in terms of um, e-cig and um, marijuana use, but still these rates are much too high. But making reference to national data, I just pulled this slide together, um, some good articles and very recently published uh, in 2020 of this year, um, worrisome increase in marijuana vaping seen among you, if, if you want to check that out in, in your leisure. So why are we talking so much about this? Well, there are certainly health concerns and impact on learning, and um, we're deeply concerned about this. So again, this comes from California Healthy Kids Survey data from 2015-17. These cigarette users are more likely um, than non-smokers to do all the following, engage in alcohol and other drug use, be truant, be less academically motivated, Experiencing chronic sadness um, and even be involved in violence and gang membership. So, um, deeply concerning how um, it seems like these high risk behaviors um, tend to be batched together with other behaviors. So, marijuana's impact on youth. We believe that the teen years, I think we'd all agree, is an incredible time of. Uh, opportunity. And um, the one thing that we know that these years are also a time of great risk for the adolescent brain. Um, the brains of young people are not fully developed until they reach their mid-20s. So again, regular uh, marijuana use during these early years can really lead to harmful uh, changes to the brain. Um, and then research is showing that when youth use cannabis, Things like memory, uh, learning, um, attention can be harmed and damaged. Um, and when that happens, you know, in um, chronic sadness, things of that sort, we worry about the behavior of skipping classes, maybe getting lower grades, um, going with a group of friends that may not, um, uh, the activities may not really be around a positive youth development. So health concerns about brain development, and I know that Julie's going to speak more about this, but we did want to kind of accent this part um, about teens developing brains and, you know, the susceptibility to the effect of nicotine. Nicotine is highly addictive um, drug. Um, it has a very short half-life, uh, triggers the reward pathway in the brain. And we worry that when um, kids are and students are uh, using these products at such an early age, specifically nicotine or especially, um, that they might be setting themselves up for other addictions of um, needing that product over and over and over again. Um, and a another uh, comment that I wanted to make is that um, while there have been some reports that um, e-cigarettes may be less damaging than the traditional combustible cigarette, um, there are a lot of studies that are out um, and we've had uh, all sorts of incidents of health problems related to uh, vaping devices. Um, very, very serious. So, at this time, you might be thinking, oh, this is discouraging. Well, um, I'd like to talk to you about what can be done and what the California Department of Education is doing um, to, to address all of these issues and vaping and marijuana youth, uh, use among youth. So this is a model that I like, and I just want to, um, you know, pick, a picture does indeed tell a thousand words. I think it's important. I think why I like this so much is it demonstrates that there's an interconnectedness between these layers. Um, and there are several factors that may influence a student's decision to vape or, you know, conversely, to refuse vaping. That comes at an individual level, 
you know, maybe what's going on at home, what the family's views are about vaping, um, you know, what their attitudes and knowledge bases um, at school, certainly, uh, are they getting instruction about these products? Uh, what do the teachers say? Um, uh, is data being collected so that students can share with, um, with us, you know, what these trends are, what their experience is? And it's not just the vaping, but the other uh, behaviors, so we can get a picture of what's going on. Um, community is another aspect uh, of this model. Um, I think just the tobacco um, advertisements that I mentioned early and the retailers, if there's a community where they're inundated with them, um, you know, uh, it's quite likely that youth are in that community are going to be less likely um, to refuse the temptation of these products. So um, this is the approach that we use and it's important in understanding it and also helps us plan uh, activities where we feel like we can make a difference in providing interventions and strategies to help you resist uh, vaping. So the triangulum, um, you know, that term that I used earlier, the intersection of tobacco, marijuana, and e-cigarettes. So um, 2B funds can be used to address the triangulum. Um, and these are the four areas that we think um, our 2B funded projects can really make a dent. So the basics, educating students and really the school community, which is staff and families and communities on the problem with the triangulum. We encourage getting data collection so we can understand the incidence of this co-use of vaping, nicotine, and marijuana. Interagency partnerships and, and engaging in your coalitions is so important. Uh, and then finally, we think it's really important to um, focus on youth development and learning service projects that focus on the impact of the media um, and emphasize the importance of making healthy choices. So if you're feeling like, well, wait a minute, I'm not a cheapy grantee, uh, fear not. These are some things that you could do in your school district. Um, maybe you can talk to um, personnel or uh, give us a call after this workshop and understand about some of the uh, presentations that might be available to you. If you're just starting out and you don't know where to begin, we can provide you with information about how to start dialoguing about uh, the triangulum and tobacco and nicotine and marijuana use. And then um, just we're so proud to be a partner of the California School Based Health Alliance and really thrilled to have a 2 presence in several of the health centers. So, you know, there's activities that include training of school based health center coordinators. There's peer education and programs and support. And then, of course, there's youth leader training. So when thinking back on that, um, that social ecological model, think about the ways in which the California School Based Health Alliance is working to get the message out about youth tobacco prevention and uh, to help the students live a, a better um, life, but also uh, the communities in which they live, hopefully a tobacco free one. So again, that was just helping to set the stage of um, my colleagues' um, uh, upcoming presentations. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And um, I invite questions at the very end of our sessions. It was a pleasure being with you today. Hi folks, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, good, and can you see my presentation? It should say the tobacco industry has kids, perfect. 
Okay, I'm gonna run fast. We're running a little bit uh, behind schedule. So um, my name's Julie Louch. I'm also with the California Department of Public Health with the Tobacco Control Branch. Uh, I'm a health program specialist too, but uh, my working title is actually, um, I'm the advertising team lead, as well as the head strategist for the media um, unit within the tobacco control branch. Um, and thinking back to Sarah's social ecological model, uh, what I'm gonna be really focusing is on the two outer rings that you saw. So the public policy and the community rings. Um, where I focus most of our attention is on uh, social norm change and policy change on a local level, because we know um, if kids grow up in an environment that are substance free and there's policies that they're growing up in um, that support that, they're more likely to be uh, tobacco free uh, and substance free. Um, so on the triangulum, I'll be focusing on the we're, we're the tobacco people at CDPH. Um, there, though there is obviously that connection point, but the nicotine piece of it and the tobacco piece of it is a really strong leg of that, <laughs> that stool and that triangulum. So I'm gonna really focus there, but there has been a real confluence of issues that includes marijuana. Um, and really that leads us to the tale of two epidemics. Uh, first is the vaping epidemic, uh, the tobacco va vaping epidemic, as the Surgeon General has called it recently. And then the second one is the E Valley uh, epidemic, which um, means e cigarette or vaping product use associated lung in injury. Um, and so, really, these two epidemics and quite frankly, the pandemic, which I'll mention later, have really converged on one another to create this. Um, there was this pretty terrifying public health crisis in the fall of 2019, not too long ago, though things feel like they're 50 years ago <laughs> these days. Um, and so again, I'll be touching on how this all uh, fits into our current public health crisis with COVID. Um, but let me go back and kind of also set some background quickly um, and mention where we've been as a state. Um, and so the California Department of Public Health and the Tobacco Control Branch has been working on vaping for five years. Um, and California was the first state to do a comprehension, comprehensive public health uh, campaign, education campaign, and it was launched with the state health officers report um, from the Department of Public Health, the director of the Par Department of Public Health, Ron Chapman in January, 2015. From there, a few months later, we launched a, a public awareness campaign called Wake Up, and that was targeted to educate parents and also young adults who we saw were using um, using the products, but really the parents needed to be aware of the problem that was uh, occurring. And so that's what we went out with, with Wake Up. And when we started this journey, we talked to parents and focus groups. They had no idea what, what we were even talking about. It wasn't even on the radar five years ago for, for parents. Now, fast forward into 20, 17 and tw to 2020 where we're talking about flavors the uh surge in parent education and awareness of the problem and and the um e-cigarette use has gone up but so has use for youth um 2016 was actually a banner year uh we had the tobacco 21 law which means that raised the minimum purchase uh, age from 18 to 21, but we also raised the tobacco tax $2. Um, there was also some other uh, great poli statewide policies that passed that year, um, including defining e-cigarettes as a tobacco product, and that was really critical in order to insert it across the board and other state policies. Um, there was also uh, a policy, a statewide policy, that if schools were receiving tobacco funding, they needed to be a tobacco-free campus. Um, 
that seemed like an obvious thing, so it was great to actually have it codified. Um, so we then rounded the corner uh, in 2017 and really started to work on the, and tackle the problem that was driving the vaping problem, which is flavors and uh, big tobacco and other industries really targeting children with social media and other advertising looking sexy and cool, but also delicious with these flavors that they have come to know and love in the candy flavors, unicorn poop, all these like fun names that they um, go wild about. And so why are we, why, do, why does this matter? Sarah touched on this, of course, in her uh, health section, but really quickly, uh, we know that nicotine is extremely addictive. It's as addictive as heroin and cocaine. Um, it also leads to permanent changes in the brain, uh, priming it for future addiction to all substances, as well as causing emotional and learning disorders. Um, there's at least 10 chemicals found uh, in e-cigarettes to cause cancer and reproductive harm. That's on California's Prop 65 list. Uh, vaping, of course, um, there's just a mount, mounting research on the topic, increasing the risk of cancer and heart disease. Um, and then the chemical flavors themselves that are in these products have been found to cause any number of lung issues and lung damage, such as popcorn lung, you might've heard of and other things. Um, looking at the numbers on the tobacco side of things, you can see here from 2016 to 2018, while other, all other uses were falling, uh, e-cigarettes was surging. Uh, but as uh, Sarah was mentioning as well, uh, the California, the interventions that California has applied um, has really kept our e-cigarette use much lower and at nearly half of all other highly diverse and populated states in the U.S. and U.S.'s nationwide numbers. This is from 2018. I know there's new numbers for the U.S., but um, those numbers are 19.6 for high school students in comparison, if you want to know for here. Um, so back to the surge, how these products are really um, driving the triangulum of use between marijuana and tobacco. Um, what we're really looking at here is these flavors and um, Teens are nearly seven times more likely to vape nicotine than adults are, and 97% of those uh, who are vaping are using flavors. So we know that this is the crux of the issue um, that's driving the behavioral addiction um, for the vaping issue. Um, there's been some uh, attempts to apply policy to this at a federal level. Um, the FDA, you all might have recalled in 2019, tried to, um, or they did, I shouldn't say tried to, they did, they uh, issued a policy to, um, they were really trying to target Juul as uh, the culprit behind the surge in, in this vaping epidemic. Um, and so they were banning cartridges, those Again, Sarah mentioned the, the types of e-cigarettes, those cartridges like jewels that you can put in. Um, they banned flavors in those, but left out menthol. And so there's been some un, there's been some issues based on that policy that we'll talk about. And you can see on this chart one of them, which was that when menthol is left on the market, it drives use of menthol. Uh, or mint flavors, you can interchange them, use them interchangeably. But um, it became a, a popular flavor to be using, and with Juul in particular. Um, I'm gonna quickly talk about the menthol story and why that's so critical of a flavor to um, the industry, the vaping industry and other industries, tobacco industry as well. Um, historically, menthol has been the flavor that they have fought for. Um, they've used it to target many different communities and particularly the African-American community. This is a, from an ad campaign we're currently working on um, to really educate the fact that uh, 
the industry knows that menthol is what they need. They need it to uh, reduce the harshness of using these products and they need it to um, further addict people to these products. And so menthol is a really critical component of not just the historical issue of tobacco use, and, but with the new emerging products with vaping. Um, and so not taking care of menthol or exempting menthol like FDA did or like um, in 2019, menthol cigarettes were exempted. And so we've created this precedent of menthol um, being a real uh, flavor that is a, an issue that needs to be um, resolved and, in order to protect children as well as uh, many different populations and communities. Um, so what the FDA's policy also didn't uh, address were the disposable e-cigarettes. And so we saw the rise of a product called Puff Bars or Puff. Um, there's, there's bar products of many different, under many different names. There's Cali Bars, there's Hype Bars, but Puff Bars really emerged as sort of the leader as of these products. On the left hand side, you can see um, it's a TikTok. There's many, many retailers and distributors on TikTok. Um, the pathway to purchase these products, you can see uh, down in the left hand corner, this particular one says discreetly shipped DM for info. Um, I personally have, have tried this and I was mailed a very discreet white package that was put into my mailbox. Um, and it had tobacco, or it had a vaping product in it. So uh, there's, there's a big issue with online sales, and in particular, these puff bars, they have sort of saturated this social, the social platforms in a way that um, they've, they've, hacked, they've hacked our systems. Um, the middle image, you can see this runs on Instagram. This runs on a lot of young adult and youth uh, oriented platforms. This one's called Solo Break. It caused a real up in arms issue um, with the FDA and other states. Um, but what this says is says Solo Break. We know that the inside vibes have been quite a challenge. Stay sane with puff bars this Solo Break. We know you'll love it. It's the perfect perfect escape from the back-to-back -back room calls, Zoom calls, parental texts, and the work from home stress. The parental text was the real trigger for there to be some action uh, on the way that these folks were marketing. Damage has sort of all, already been done. Some of the other really manipulative advertising that you can see is on the right, uh, where they've been offering uh, masks and other um, kinds of COVID related free items um, with a purchase of a vape. And so I want to pull this all down into um, some real life quotes that we get from a widget on our flavorshookkids.org website. Um, this top one is from parents. So we were gathering testimonials from parents and children. Um, in their experience with vaping. And for parents, this one says, my 17 year old son won't stop vaping no matter how unhealthy it is. I'm afraid he will get lung cancer by the time he's 25. This other parent said, we just found out our daughter was vaping. She's only 12 years old. Someone told her through social media that it would help calm her stress. Now, our number one goal right now is to get her the help she needs to feel better. And from the teen's point of view, I started vaping back in the mid to late eighth grade, and now it's the end of ninth. I stopped vaping mainly because I've recently been feeling ill with feelings of fever, a, no a little nausea, and threw up a couple weeks ago the day I stopped. The other one, I'm a, fre I'm a freshman in high school and I got addicted quick. I burned through a pod a day, which is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. And I, at first, thought that was cool before I started coughing. I'm scared to tell my mom because she told me not to and I didn't know the consequences that came with it. Right now, I haven't seen a doctor out of sheer fear, but I might have to if this coughing gets any worse. Um, I know I've been talking a lot about tobacco. So um, I'm glad 
Sarah was really uh, walking us through the marijuana piece, um, but just I'll stop, pause here for a second. So we have seen um, the 58% increase in marijuana vaping amongst youth in a single year. That's from monitoring the future. And then 2018, 14.7% of high school students in California reported um, using marijuana. That's using it in many different ways. And then the image here you can see though different types of ways that uh, students are using it and vapor is climbing, uh, va vape <laughs> uh, is climbing. Um, so here is where uh, the triangulum inside, it was like the Bermuda Triangle, it just sort of created havoc. Um, and that's with what happened uh, at the end of last year with a valley. And so this was a mysterious, potentially fatal uh, um, lung illness um, that was occurring into late 2019, early 2020. Kids and young adults made uh, up almost half of the people hospitalized. We do know that the majority of cases were cannabis related. You'll see the image, dank vapes. Um, were a major culprit. Dank bakes isn't actually, though it looks very um, suave marketing. People just buy the cartons, the packaging, they buy the packaging from anywhere, and then it, it could be who knows what inside. And that was really what was uh, driving most of the cases of the Valley. However, there's this mysterious about 10% that were nicotine only. Um, and what's fascinating there is that there are C in CDPH, there's, we have researchers and scientists, and there's a preliminary paper that was recently published, um, and it looked at this mysterious 10%, and um, it identified a chemical called, called ethanone, and it was the non-vitamin E acetate e valley cases um, that created a, a lung injury um, similar to that, uh, which is sustained during chemical warfare. So it essentially burns the inside of the lungs. Um, incredibly uh, challenging to hear. This is what children are using and vaping. Um, there's no regulations about labeling and what goes into these products. So. Um, also around this time, Juul itself had contaminated pods that was being reported on. They hid it from people. Millions of contaminated pods with fungus were shipped out to um, different places and distributed. So there's a lot of different issues. Um, the symptoms of a valley I listed because I'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, trouble catching your breath, coughing, chest pain, gastrointestinal systems, uh, symptoms and then nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, fever, weight loss. Um, so in response to E-Valley, uh, Governor Newsom said we needed to take immediate action. So we launched a vaping awareness campaign to denormalize vaping. Um, we were focusing on reaching young adults and older teens, as well as parents. We needed to make sure that we got in front of the people who are making immediate medical decisions. Um, and so parents are a really critical part of that for um, middle school and high school students. There's the ones that are gonna be calling the doctors, their kid has a cough, they're, they're the ones that needed to know and know fast that there was a real problem if their kid, if their child was vaping. Um, I don't think we have time to show these, honestly, so I'm just going to go, I was going to show videos of what these ads are. You can go on to YouTube slash Tobacco Free CA and you can find them there, vape outbreak ads. There's two of them if you're curious to see them. Um, so I'm going to go jump right ahead into COVID and uh, that's where we are at now. How this uh, connects to this topic is that youth and young adult vaping is associated to five to seven times greater risk of testing positive for COVID-19. Um, teens who vape uh, could face higher complications from COVID-19 uh, because vaping weakens lungs with toxic chemicals and fine metal particles. Um, but there certainly was this confusion. Think back just a couple slides. The symptoms of E Valley are very similar to the symptoms of COVID. There was a lot of confusion. There still is um, some reports of diagnosis confusion um, that was happening for between E Valley and COVID. 
Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there is progress happening at a policy level. Uh, local jurisdictions, 101 pol uh, policies across the state of California. This is the latest and greatest number. We just had two more added to this like two days ago in uh, Northern California, which was very exciting. But these are banning the sale of flavored tobacco, most of them including menthol cigarettes, which, which is very good. Um, and that, of course, uh, brings us to the statewide law that was passed or signed into law August 28th by Governor Newsom, um, which ended the sale of most flavored tobacco products, including vapes and menthol cigarettes. Um, this would uh, extremely uh, decrease the access to vapes. However, there is still a question about online sales. Does this law cover that or not? Um, but not 24 business hours after Governor Newsom signed it into law, a referendum was filed by Big Tobacco um, and their signature gathering right now to qualify this. And essentially that puts the law on hold for two years. So we would essentially be sacrificing um, the addiction of this new generation for another two years um, because of Big Tobacco's greed. Um, and California is one of the largest markets that they have. They make an incredible amount of money here. And so this is something that they're fighting hard against. Um, and we're waiting until the end of November to see if they're able to uh, gather enough signatures and qualify um, in order to put this as an initiative on the November 2022 ballot. Great, thank you so much, Julie. We're going to move on to Sonia now. Let me stop sharing here. Thank you, Julie um, and uh, Sarah for the background on um, tobacco and sort of the, the sense of urgency um, of, of uh, in interventions that we need for our students and our families. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, so I do have my uh, tobacco use prevention education uh, website there if you'd like to learn additional strategies or to learn more. Um, so excuse me as I brief through the slides uh, very quickly, but um, my name is Sonia Gutierrez and I'm the tobacco use prevention education coordinator at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I really wanted to bring in how positive behavior interventions and supports is a framework that we use as we operate our 2B program, um, or if you don't have a 2B program on your campus, how you can really operate an anti-vaping program. Sorry, it's not clicking. <laughs> What program are you using? Is PowerPoint? PowerPoint? Okay. Yeah. Are you seeing um, two arrows in the bottom left corner? Two arrows. Um, no, I'm not. Okay, are you presenting your full screen or a window? Full screen. Come on. Uh, sorry, you guys. Let me, um, should I stop share and we do it? Sure, sounds good. Oh my gosh, okay, let me do that again. Okay, so I have like five minutes. Um, there it goes, yay. There we go, great. Oh, All right, great. So um, just really quickly, um, I want to reiterate that the, we use multi-tiered systems and supports, which is the umbrella, and this is where PBIS lives. Um, and the reason why we use this because it's data driven and we know that it works, it's evidence based, it's efficient and, and it's effective for um, our learning environments. And the way it can fit into the 2B program, if you look at it with a public health lens, you can see that we use it through prevention, 
intervention um, in the middle tier and also cessation or intensive intervention. Um, and so I'm gonna share strategies on how we can do that. Um, I don't know if we have time for the poll. Um, I don't think we do. Um, but um, I initially wanted to think, or maybe you can use a chat box at this time. Um, what happens um, at your school if a student is found vaping in the bathroom? And you can write in there whether um, you refer students to brief intervention, whether you suspend students, uh, provide restorative practices, or provide another alternative means. Um, and if, you, if you're able to share what the chat box says, so I can get a fill of, since I'm not able to see it. The common, um, the common answer with this is usually suspension. Um, and so um, I wanted to briefly share that um, 119 students actually have been expelled for tobacco use within the state of California. And briefly with our Santa Clara County data, we have about you know, 10,487 students who were suspended um, and about 33% were it was because of tobacco use. Um, and, and the reason why I'm sharing this, because if you were to look at your county data or even your, your school district data, it's really important to see or to aggregate the data to really see kind of who needs the most supports. And with using a PBIS framework, you really want to tailor uh, support programs um, for students who need it the most. Um, and so unfortunately, you see here within our own data, which is very similar, that um, you know, our foster youth, um, our foster youth and our students with disabilities and our African American students have um, the highest suspensions. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but um, we, it's looking at how do we have strategies to keep students on campus, keep them in the classroom and providing other, other means to support students. Um, let's see, I have a few more minutes, so I don't know um, if I should go very briefly through each slide, but I want to show examples of a tier one intervention that um, you wanna have your tobacco free policies in place. You wanna have within the policy, alternatives to suspension methods um, so that way um, we are providing options to students and families. You want to be data driven. Sarah mentioned the data that we use in Tupi. You want to use prevention education. What are the curriculums available that, that support social emotional health? Um, and I have here the, the Tupi office recommended uh, curriculums. Um, what are some, how can we engage parents in this conversation? How do we provide tools for them and to practice communicating with, with their child? Um, and to really take advantage of those opportunities. And then how do we really use youth um, as our partners um, who, and, and really showcasing their lived experiences and, and having them provide sort of awareness campaigns. In the second tier, I really wanna highlight the pro-social opportunities where we can really build those leadership skills in youth who can then be a role model or, or um, uh, create peer education to their younger generation of students and hear, we can hear their story. So getting the youth involved is my number one priority um, you know, use them in panels, have them operate panels, have them create presentations. Um, and then of course, how do we provide counseling and support to our school counselors um, to, to give them the tools that they need for a motivational interviewing, stage, using the stages of change model, harm reduction to really support our students. And then, and then also to know, as we heard, that these products are very addicting. How do we have a referral process? So that way we can give them the supports that they need. And so I have brief intervention as one example. I have healthy futures as another one by Stanford University if it's a group setting. But please explore other means like restorative practices, peer support groups, or other mental health means you may have on your campus that could be very helpful. Um, lastly, cessation services, right? What are what's available? And in COVID, youth have been using the text and chat lines, which has been really great to hear. So let's continue to utilize that. I have a list of resources available here. Please take advantage of those and share widely. When schools are able to go back on campus, we have stickers and posters we post everywhere in the locker room or in the bathroom, places where you know you are vaping, so that way they can get the resources that they need and also teaching coping mechanism. What can you do instead? What is healthy? You know, exercising, meditating, um, what is your natural high? Or would we really talk about marijuana? Um, and I know it was very fast, so I completely apologize, but I do want to share the website is going to link is going to be available in the chat box. There's a handout available for you that really goes into California Ed Code and alternative means um, running um, an anti vaping to be sort of anti drug program. Um, my email is here and I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. As Sonia mentioned, the link to Tubi will be available in the chat, so please see that. And as all of our sessions, this will be available on the CSHA website starting next week.